When we first got a diagnosis for our son, um, we didn't know what autism was. I had never seen anything like what I saw in my house with this child who was so unusual. He was not talking, extremely agile, a runner. He could get out of any door. Um, there was just something going on. So there was a young psychiatrist from uh, Houston who came to Lake Charles, Louisiana, where we were living at the time, and right away he said, I think your son has autism. What's that? He says, well, it means he'll always be a little strange. Well, I found out how all a little strange was after I got into it. So I said, well, what can be done? He says, well, um, as far as we know, there is nothing to be done. Uh, just watch him carefully and uh, watch as he grows. Um, so I was kind of on my own. About that time, we were getting ready to move to upstate New York, from South Louisiana to upstate New York. So believe me, I had more in my mind than Joseph Klein on top of cabinets. Once we got settled in, in Albany, New York, I began to ask around for um, pediatric uh, psychiatrists. They recommended, of course, that uh, we, get to ha we get together and meet other mothers and, and talk to each other. And I, right away I asked for some literature to read. There was, and they tell me there was not much, not much that you would understand, Mrs. Sullivan. Nothing could have sent me to the library quicker than telling me I wouldn't understand it. But they were right, there was almost nothing in the library. And what there was was not good to hear, that mothers caused autism. It, it, all the children were acting alike. And you can't, that's pretty hard to deny. If all these children are acting alike and they live in, in a quarter of the country, it can't be one family's mistakes in raising children that caused them to act like this. He said, don't worry. There's nothing you can do. You're just an overanxious mother. That's what I got. They told me that they were going to do us, they were doing us a favor. They were going to call all the mothers in and I would be notified. I couldn't wait to meet the other mothers. So all the mothers came in and they let us alone in a room, to their credit. There were about 14 of us. We're sitting around the room. None of us believed that we had caused what was going on with our children. But that some of them did take it a little bit more seriously than they, sh they should have, and they were extremely depressed, you can imagine. So I sent a piece of paper around and asked them all to put their names and their address and their telephone number. And we met again, but they didn't know we were meeting. It, from there on, it was a group of mothers who met. Uh, the fathers began to come. Uh, it got larger and larger, and I could see that we were not the only ones in the country. I was beginning to get some publicity in the in the newspapers, I knew a lot about working with local media because I had been with the League of Women Voters and worked with the media quite often. The media was thrilled. It was such wonderful stories that we could tell. These mothers had these stories that had never been told. So the word got out. So my name was out there. In the meantime, there was a guy on Long Island who had read Bernie Rimland's book. Bernie Rimland was the first person to, to uh, right as a parent of an autistic child. He thought he knew something about psychology, so now he's a PhD in psychology, and all the literature that he's reading says he caused his son's autism. He didn't believe it either. So he, was, so he wrote a book. The name of Bernie's book was Infantile Autism. And uh, so I couldn't wait to get a copy of it. And got a copy of it and wrote to him. In fact, I think I called him. And that's how I got to meet him. So with the two of us together, uh, we were able to very easily get groups of people together. Because by this time, there were radios and televisions. Television was our new media. They were looking for good stories. You can hardly find a better story. We made sure every state had a very well-informed uh, society for autistic children, we said at first. And very soon after three years, we realized you can't say children, they grow up. So it's the Autism Society of America. What happened so far is almost miraculous. It was amazing because, because it's such an interesting disability. I don't think it would have been as interesting if you had bad feet or you had a bad back 
But you see, the Lord made it so fascinating that, you know, it, it, it was just set up. He's going to give you a, a, a disability that's extremely difficult, that nobody heard of, there's no money for, but they're going to be so interesting that it'll just pull attention. So it worked. The main thing still left to be done, or one of the main things, is crossing state lines. My son has excellent services. Our state has more autism first than any other state in the Union. This county has more autism first than other county in West Virginia. But we cannot cross state lines with Medicaid money. I live alone in my house. All my kids have gone. The only one who's left here is Joseph because he has such good services in this town. It's the government's responsibility to take care of its citizens as best they can. And when you come to medicine, you don't say we're going to do things as, as far as the money is concerned. You know, what else would we not have done if the, if the medical profession had been completely limited by its, its money? On education, um, we now have the first, uh, the first university probably in the world, as far as I know, the first university in the world that has a course specific in autism, specifically in autism, not just part of a, a psychology course. It's a specific department in the university. I would want all that to happen, to have a specific department at each university not just part of the, the health department. And that there would be specific departments in, in, um, in research, in brain research, because we, have, we still don't know what causes autism. <laughs>